Welcome to the Revenue Marketing Report powered by CaliberMind. Our goal on the RMR is to help marketers move from subject matter experts to strategic business partners. I'm your host, Kamala Thompson, and today I'm thrilled to introduce Ali Wittick. Ali, please tell us a little bit about yourself. Hi, Kamala. Thank you for having me today. I have been fortunate to have had a very positive exit from corporate America earlier this year after 10 years in marketing ops. And I went straight into building my own business, Marteca, which helps marketing teams at big B2B companies clean up their dirty or decayed databases, get their automation tools operating at their fullest potential, and help them get the most out of their marketing automation investments. And so now that I'm on the the flip side, I can relate to your podcast mission a lot of how do marketing ops people get from SME to more of a strategic business leader position. I love it because I have gone to consulting myself and it's, it's fabulous if your personality fits with it. Like I, I never liked getting into the day-to-day detail of maintenance. I always loved tackling huge projects and fixing problems. So for those of us out there who love a huge challenge, <laughs> consulting seems to be a pretty darn good fit. How, how are, you, are you finding it? that way so far? Oh, a hundred percent. I think anyone in marketing ops can agree. There's just so much that falls on their plate. And once you're able to ignore some of that minutia that often falls only on marketing ops, you're really able to see the big picture and, and help clients see what's possible and also what's not possible. Yeah. Great point. When you're so busy trying to get things done, it's hard to look at the big picture. That's a great point. So as we were talking about topics, we kind of landed on one that's near and dear to my heart, and that is data privacy. I have a horror story. I knew somebody who was blacklisted for marketing ops because of some privacy compliancy issues, and it can really ruin your career. So what had happened was several people opted out out of a communication, and this was back in the day when email marketing was known to work, and a lot of companies were sending multiple emails per week. That is not best practice, we know that, but several people had opted out and they decided to ignore the unsubscribe and the company got sued. Mm. So not a good move. Um, That person had to move out of marketing operations. It was just a big mess. So there's a joke on the internet that unsubscribe is fake because so many people misconfigure things and ignore it. It's really important to research how your particular automation platform handles it because some automation platforms, they store emails that have opted out externally to your database. So even if you delete somebody and they come back, you have that historical record. Some of them don't. So just word to the wise, research how your automation platform uses it. So you can worst case, keep your own records offline of who's opted out so you can ensure that if somebody comes back around that you don't accidentally bomb them with emails. That's so interesting. I have a I have a lesser impact story, but also a horror story from a couple years back. I was in a situation where the the client I was supporting wanted to send out mass holiday cards, uh-huh. Christmas cards to the entire database. Yeah. And this is one of those examples where marketing ops are not oftentimes equipped to push back appropriately. Mm-hmm. And we said like, we should not email the entire database. There's, it was just a generic happy holidays type message. There was no real like CTA in this at all. Sorry. There was no real value. It, it was just like two sentences, happy holidays. And we weren't able to push back. Um, So we sent the email out and it had such high opt-outs and bounces that Pardot issued a formal violation, which means that people actually reported that as spam. Mm -hmm. And it's just such a, it's not a good look. It wasn't worth it, especially when you, when you pull back the layers of what is the actual reason for a holiday card? It's a personal message, right? Yeah. And so just having a framework of what constitutes a mass email and what is just not worth the risk. Yeah. Common sense, you would hope, would argue against (laughs) doing that. I'm sorry that happened. Let's, Let's dig into that a little bit more. What does data privacy 
What does it encompass? Yeah, so I think one interesting thing about just the the world that we are stepping into as marketers is you probably remember a couple of years ago that big headline in the Economist that came out and said the world's most valuable resource is no longer oil but data, and this is a very important topic for marketers. I think it's interesting that marketing ops people are expected to be the technical expert but also have to play a role in the policy and the data privacy side of the house. Mm-hmm. And there's there's not many professions I know of where someone has to be the technical expert as well as the legal point of view on something. Right. But understanding data security and privacy can be a competitive differentiator for marketers. I think ideally most companies by now one would hope have a clear stance on data privacy and how they process people's personal information. I think probably if your if your company or your client doesn't more than likely you have a personal perspective on data privacy and what companies can capture and track and use and what they cannot. Do you kind of agree with that? Yeah. Yeah. I I always thought it was interesting. In some cases, the lawyer was almost hesitant to take it on because (laughs) the less they knew, the less liable they were for any issues that potentially happen. But I think a lot of companies I worked with kind of had the attitude of, well, we don't sell to EMEA, so we don't need to worry about GDPR. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, okay, well, what about the latest laws in California, Virginia, and now we're looking at New York Shield. There's just a lot of things trending in a specific direction that put it in your best interest to timestamp everything, make sure you have a record of how they opted in. It's just best practice. I agree. I think this is what happens with trends is when new regulations happen, people don't take it seriously. Mm -hmm. And then they hear stories of the poster child of somebody who received a formal violation. Mm -hmm. And for companies making more than 20 million in revenue, it's not going to be a huge issue. But if your company is a small company and is getting a GDPR violation, that has the ability to bankrupt you. Yeah. Yeah, and they they will go after you. <laughs> it's yeah. almost like they want to make examples of people from different or companies in different size ranges. So just because you're a small company doesn't mean you're above their notice for sure. It just takes a couple of people complaining. I know, and that's the thing is as consumers start becoming more aware of data privacy laws, then they're going to start realizing that they're, I'm using air quotes, victims of companies exploiting their PII, Mm -hmm. and they're going to start reporting it. So I think there's going to be a lot more. I think there's going to be a wave of people that are starting to care a lot more and file complaints. Yeah. I mean, even the way marketing automation tools are acting now versus when I first started is vastly different. So for example, it used to be back in the day that anybody in can spam uh, US states You could buy a list from a vendor and just start emailing them. And now most of the marketing automation, and I'm dating myself, I'm kind of older. And now most of the marketing automation platforms have in their contract a clause that you cannot email or communicate with anybody who has not proactively opted into your communications. So it's just, if you're not taking it seriously, you're missing a lot of red flags. (laughs) Yeah. You don't want to be that person either. No, no, we don't want to be the story, the cautionary tale. How should we go about convincing leadership that they should invest in the tools and resources needed to do data privacy well? So to to get your client to buy into the idea that both of these are fundamentally important, I find it most effective to drive the conversation around cost. So playing out the worst case scenario, what are the costs associated with violating a privacy law? What would be the reputational cost of being the poster child company that exploited people's personal data? And what is the financial cost, both revenue and fines? And the goal is to shift clients from thinking of privacy and compliance as checking the box to more proactively putting things in place that ensure marketing data is compliant So minor mistakes don't end up being detrimental to the entire marketing team. And those are great points because I think it really is all about risk management. 
Right. And bridging that gap, in my opinion, is, is like you said, having a clean database and focusing on acquiring clean leads if you're doing lead generation. So on the flip side of the coin, I like to discuss the cost of acquiring new compliant leads, like getting very clear on cost per lead or CPL. And it's helpful to get on the same page and have everyone well aware of each channel's CPLs. So for instance, if you're doing SEO and SEM, it's about $30 to $100 CPL. LinkedIn advertising, more expensive, $75 to $100 CPL. And that's why I do always come back to enrichment and tools like Zoom Info because it's the lowest CPL. It's about $1 CPL. So that's where I typically always fall back to the value of enrichment tools and using them as a marketing channel because you're getting clean data and the CPL is low. Yes. And you're also ensuring that you're getting the right country data for the individual for where they reside, which is so critical. Critical. Have you been burned by attribution? Are you tired of fighting with salespeople over target accounts and lead scores? We've all been there. And that's because traditional marketing analytics tools bolt onto your CRM and calculate attribution and engagement scores on the data as it is. And let's face it, most of the time, your CRM data is far from perfect. Caliber Mind is unique because it pulls data from all your sources, not just your CRM, into a data platform. Caliber Mind unifies your information, which means you can attribute dollars to website activity, standard Salesforce campaign activity, and more without wasting time in spreadsheets. Ditch the spreadsheets and check out a new way to analyze revenue data with Caliber Mind at calibermind.com. This may have changed over the last couple of years. I haven't dug into it recently, but it used to be that those people in Germany required a double opt-in as opposed to just an opt-in. And those enrichment tools can be great when it comes to figuring out where somebody is physically located and where somebody is typically located. Because even if somebody from Europe is traveling into the United States to go to a trade show and you collect their information, you're somehow supposed to figure out that they're a member of the European Union and treat their data accordingly. So having those enrichment tools, looking at IP addresses and then when where their actual shipping or mailing addresses are, is all a really great practice. Totally. Or if you were in a if you stepped into a client or a company that wasn't capturing consistent data to begin with, say they didn't capture title information. Mm -hmm. And now you have half of your database with that and half without. I think that's another great use for enrichment. I think that most automation softwares now have built in enrichment for country data, like your example you just mentioned about Germany. Mm -hmm. Um, But that's diverting to the company's headquarters country. Not and what matters is the person right. location. <laughs> right. Uh, it's a lot. <laughs> uh, but I think one of the arguments I've had success with anyway is that investing in this kind of infrastructure and taking the time to define privacy policies and using the resources to do that is a big reduction in risk to the company. Especially, like you said, the companies that are under 20 million ARR that just really could be taken out by a lawsuit. Yep. You mentioned Zoom Info. Are there any other tools in the market that you've seen you'd consider best in class along these lines for enrichment and then privacy management? Privacy management, I would divert to using the tools within your Pardot, Marketo, HubSpot instance. Mm -hmm. For enrichment, I, I strongly favor Zoom Info. I think once Discover Org acquired Zoom Info a couple of years ago, that just made them the most trusted in B2B contact data. I don't know if you've heard of their new intent data also, which helps you see what, what people are actually searching for. Yeah, I heard that was coming out. I think those are the best tools. I- yeah, and I would agree that most of our marketing automation systems, even MailChimp, I shouldn't say even MailChimp, they do a pretty good job, <laughs> especially if, you know, as you and I as consultants and freelancers, we probably... I use it. It is extremely simple to set up the double opt-in, figuring out when to send an automated workflow for people in those countries. So we too can be observant of the GDPR regulations. 
I would love to hear, you don't need to name the clients or anything like that, but I would love to hear how some of your clients have used best practices to set up privacy compliance. I have an example right now of a client I'm supporting. I'm, I'm so proud of them. They are starting over with a greenfield space. They bought a new HubSpot instance mm -hmm. and they had an opportunity to dump in their legacy contact records or a purchase list, but they have strategically opted to not do that, to properly nurture people that they have acquired through enrichment, through sales one-to-ones, and then convert them only once that person has taken an action or requested more information. The reason I think this is possible for this client is because the marketing leadership is not setting up these strange expectations and goals so she really values quality over quantity. She's not getting unrealistic expectations and pressure from her leadership. They're saying, we want to see who's actually engaged, who's actually interested in our material and hearing from us. And so I think that, that that's a, an example in my world where sales and marketing is working together really well. You can still make the nurture path or engagement or drip program mm -hmm. on the sales side, but not, not thinking that everybody is a marketing contact waiting until they have explicitly asked to be opted in or they've requested more information. Yeah. And I think that probably goes back to, I've seen a lot of organizations have really high MQL goals and mm -hmm. lead goals yep. and not have a counter focus or, or a balance that looks at pipeline and revenue generation because volume is not always a good thing. We can always go yeah. buy content syndication leads and I pick on them a lot. So I think content syndication is great for getting names who have opted in to a nurture. I don't think it's a great thing to pass to your salesperson and try to get a sale right away. Right. Um, so setting the right goals and having the right analytics in place so you can tie your activities back to revenue is just everything today. I agree. I'm actually on a personal note, I'm taking poker lessons. <gasps> That's so cool. One thing my poker coach has taught me is statistically 70% of your hands will be garbage and you don't need, you don't need to feel an urge to play every hand. You should bet on quality hands. And I think that that lesson is important in yeah. marketing and marketing ops as well. If your data isn't high quality, you shouldn't be betting on it. Not every single lead is quality. Just kind of having this assumption that 70% is probably bad and that's okay. Love it. I heard that you and a couple of other marketing ops people developed something we all need. If you could please describe and let us know where to find it, that would be awesome. Yes, we're putting the finishing touches on it right now. I asked my two people that I worked with on this when we think it's going to be ready. We think early September, but... Anna Leary, who's been a previous guest on your show, Brian Deandra, and um, myself put together this lexicon, which is taking the, the most commonly used automation terms across Marketo, Pardot, and HubSpot, and making a table of what this means in Pardot and what the word is used in Marketo and, and HubSpot. We noticed that this has never been made before, just like a quick overview table showing how everything is so similar, but it's using different words. And we're excited to share it with the marketing ops community. We'll put a link out there because I, I think that I can't believe it hasn't been done before. I know. <laughs> we were thinking the same thing. Yeah, because I remember moving from Eloqua to Marketo and trying to work with some consultants and using program instead of channel or vice versa. And everybody was confused. It's a mess. <laughs> Totally. Well, Ellie, thank you so much for being on the podcast. I really appreciate it. Where can people find you online to, to network? My website is, my Marteca website is www.mar-teca.com. And yeah, I would love to connect with anyone who this struck a chord with or anyone who wants to talk about privacy, compliance. I'm excited by the work you're doing. So thank you for having me. Wonderful, wonderful. And do you prefer to focus on HubSpot, Pardot, any systems or are you system agnostic? I prefer Pardot, mm -hmm. but I have, I've had clients in HubSpot and Marketo, um, but I'm a Pardot expert. 
And once again, I would like to encourage others out there to stay open to opportunities outside of the one system that they know they know because these skills are transferable. And maybe our, our one page guide will help people realize that they're more alike than different. I love it. I love it. And for those of you looking for more great content like this, check out calibermind.com.